Good evening, Susan, to you and to everybody here. And thank you very much for coming. It's my great pleasure. Uh, my last, uh, uh, our last seminar was on Slovenian issues with Slovenian participants. Mm -hmm. Now we shift to, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, British English mm -hmm. issues with a UK participant. Uh, you will, uh, you are coming from the University of Bristol. That's great. Just to let uh, basic uh, data on you to our colleagues here, and uh, we know that uh, something is burning in uh, England in last weeks or perhaps months, but we don't know exactly. Uh, perhaps you don't know exactly that the weather here is usually coming from northwest. So it's a guess in Slovenia that maybe we need to know what's going on. Perhaps two or three days later it comes to us. Today we have very strong wind down in the Mediterranean. Hopefully this will not be of that kind. Anyway, you promised us to give an introductory lecture on government higher education through crisis, in the case of the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, the floor is yours. After the presentation, we will, of course, prepare our questions. Thank you. Um, well, it's uh, good evening, everyone. It's um, really a great pleasure to be here, and always a great pleasure to be in the company of um, Pavel, who's um, very, very significant in uh, the field of higher education. And uh, so it's also an opportunity, I think, uh, for me to um, put out some ideas and uh, engage with all of you in the room. And I'm very interested in the kinds of thoughts and comments that you might have. As you can see, um, the title of the presentation is uh, Governing Through Crisis. Um, and I must say, um, there are many crises uh, in the UK at the current time, and one of those is uh, not just a financial crisis more generally, but um, a crisis uh, of the public or for the public sector, and most certainly a crisis for higher education, uh, which is what I specifically uh, want to focus on. However, the financial crisis and the crisis of the public sector, the crisis that's being presented as a public sector crisis, and the very dramatic changes that are now um, underway in the UK and UK higher education, I really hope they don't um, travel at all. And I did speak to a reporter today um, and gave him some very strong health warnings. Um, presuming he reports these, um, about um, some of the perils of um, policy borrowing. Um, and perhaps what I want to do tonight is uh, engage in a little bit of uh, reflection and critical reflection on quite what is at stake for uh, issues of, I think, uh, broadly knowledge, uh, issues for the university and uh, broadly issues of autonomy. Um, I think issues for very fundamentally some of the missions for universities. Uh, those missions clearly have been uh, broadening to include uh, a third mission, um, a third mission that concerns itself. It says broadly with issues of uh, engagement, um, but uh, in the case of the UK at the moment, it's largely taking the form of engagement with the, um, with the private sector and with industry. So what future for UK higher education? Um, what I will be doing tonight is trying to look back at the kind of writing that emerged in the 1970s by very distinguished uh, writers, um, largely political scientists and sociologists, thinking about crisis and what it meant to, to, to try and theorise the crisis of the state. And I would actually argue that what we are fundamentally facing um, in the UK is um, a fundamental crisis of the state. So what was it that those theorists at the time, uh, Klaus Off, uh, Habermas, uh, James O'Connor, um, so a range of theorists, uh, continental theorists and US theorists, um, in the early 1970s, uh, Arigi we could also um, add in there, um, worrying themselves about then what it meant to think about the crisis and what was it a crisis of and how might we think about 
the state in relation to that crisis. So that's some of the work that I want to do. Um, I think it's very important, and, and um, I'm often inspired by um, uh, Musalis's work, who encourages us to go back and reread, to read back um, into the kinds of uh, texts um, that were very helpful and very insightful at particular periods of time and go back to those texts with new problems and perhaps uh, with, the, uh, um, with the voyage, I guess, of some degree of history behind us to, uh, and, and, and bring it into the contemporary period and uh, take those insights and look at uh, the kinds of issues um, that we face in the current period. So that's the journey um, that I want to take you on. But it's very clear that uh, a series of events um, that um, I guess to some extent um, become iconic in what's called um, the um, subprime mortgage um, uh, crisis in the United States. But fundamentally it's not a crisis of housing. It's a crisis of the ways in which um, the finance sector in particular that globalises uh, itself from the, uh, from the early 80s onwards in particular, uh, driven by neoliberal policies, uh, that, in, that, that in fact uh, reach, reaches a particular uh, point um, of collapse. So we actually see um, the, uh, the, the finance sector uh, really running out of control. And uh, at that particular point, uh, August largely uh, around this particular point, 2008, uh, when essentially um, the heads of governments uh, needed to come together and needed to uh, strategize as uh, a collective of heads of government in order to essentially pull these economies back from the brink. So here we have the stock exchange that is, 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 is moving around absolutely wildly. Um, banks not lending to other banks, uh, bad money, um, for example, uh, wanting to be offloaded and others not wanting to buy that. Um, most definitely uh, the sense that uh, there was an economic crisis of global proportions now confronting us. And we see it on a daily basis, uh, even now, um, if we look across the economies, uh, Portugal in trouble, Greece has been in trouble, Ireland is being ba bailed out, um, and the economy that I want to look at, um, the UK economy, uh, confronted um, by um, enormous and very deep cuts, although I want to problematise um, tonight as to whether in fact uh, the extent of those cuts um, are quite uh, what is actually needed, and indeed the pace of those cuts. So I will be suggesting there's an ideological project at work uh, that's attempting to um, advance um, um, you know, almost a kind of hyper form of uh, neoliberalism. And I want to reflect on what that might mean for the higher education sector specifically. Um, so this is essentially the scene that we face uh, in 2008. Um, and it's a scene that uh, has um, shaken uh, governments. Um, governments have dealt with the, th these issues in rather different ways. Um, what we've seen is the Obama administration essentially come to power at a very difficult point in time in the United States, um, <laughs> has tried to uh, uh, deploy some degree of Keynesian kinds of policies, that is state planning policies, in order to uh, look at ways in which they might pull the United States out of the slump. But that's not quite what we're seeing uh, in the case of the UK. Um, and what we're seeing, I think, is an intensification of neoliberal policies. So the outline of the presentation then will be to look at um, broadly crisis higher education in the state and I want to pose several questions here. I want to look back at uh, the early 1970s and that literature and the ways in which uh, a crisis was talked about um, and particularly the work of Klaus Off who um, puts on the table essentially a way of thinking about the crisis of the state, um, that is in relation to capitalism. Um, and he calls it a crisis of crisis management. In other words, capitalism itself is fundamentally crisis prone. And what the state is always doing is managing a crisis prone 
system. And when the state is no longer able to manage, then essentially what we have is a crisis of crisis management. I want to look at then uh, the ways in which um, that crisis was dealt with and the kinds of uh, strategic and structural selectivities that were put into place um, under uh, neoliberal policies that fundamentally then transformed the UK higher education si si scene and system um, in quite dramatic kinds of ways. I want to then suggest that the kind of crisis that has emerged um, that we're looking at over the last um, two, three years is fundamentally a crisis of regulatory policy. It's um, a way of looking at that crisis very tentatively that Klaus Off puts in a book that he, he writes, uh, Modernity in the State, East and West, in 1996. At that point, uh, there's no way he could have imagined the kind of crisis at one level uh, at least empirically that we're looking at. But there's a kind of logic that begins to emerge from the kinds of neoliberal policies um, that we're looking at. Um, you can begin to speculate on what the outcomes might be from those fundamental contradictions uh, that then would underpin um, a period of neoliberalism as a political project. I want to then look at uh, the ways that's being dealt with uh, the uh, interventions, but to actually argue that if it's a crisis of regulatory policy and what we're not seeing is the regulatory policies that were uh, fundamentally causal in relation to the crisis, then in essence what we will see is a deepening of the crisis um, and um, in essence potentially a collapse of neoliberalism as a political project fundamentally as Keynesianism itself, uh, which guided many of the Western uh, developed economies through that post-war period, um, exhausted itself by the early 1980s. So that's the broad kind of argument. It's um, tentative um, to some extent. It's a paper in the making. Um, it's the outcome of um, collaborations and deliberations that uh, a group of us students and academics have been engaged in trying to uh, read uh, through the crisis and read the crisis literature again in order to, 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 to make some sense of what that mind might mean for us. So these are the questions that I, I want to address. Is the current financial crisis in the UK and the displacement, and I use that word displacement of that crisis um, um, in a considered way, into the public sector and in particular to the university sector, um, the other sectors of education, to a large extent, um, aside from further education, have been, for this moment, protected. So the focus, particularly in the public sector and the education component of the public sector, is on universities and university provision. Um, and maybe there's a, a kind of electoral issues in there um, for the current government as to then why they've actually uh, identified a particular sector, the university sector, um, or whether they in fact imagine that there are uh, policy uh, levers and policy solutions that they can generate in that sector uh, without the significant fallout that you might have if uh, other areas of the education sector were tackled. Um, but I'm particularly interested in whether um, that crisis um, will challenge the hegemony of neoliberalism as a political project. And that question really, I guess, uh, emerges from um, a, a, quite a number of pieces of work that we've seen um, around um, the uh, academy, um, talking about uh, post-neoliberalism. So there's quite a significant debate about uh, if we see forms of nationalisation taking place where, in the case of the UK, the banks, uh, many of the banks were uh, bailed out with very significant investments of, very, very significant investments of public funding. Um, whether we see then, as a consequence of that, those nationalising tendencies, um, the emergence of neoliberalism or the demise of neoliberalism and the emergence of post-neoliberal policies and so on. So that's kind of one question I want to deal with. Um, or the reverse question here is, is the current crisis deepening and intensifying neoliberalism with what effect and what long-term outcome for higher education and its public good nature? So 
they're kind of two questions, uh, really the opposite sides of the same kind of coin. Now, over the last six months, um, it's been very heartening, I must say, to see an enormous amount of protest out on the street. Uh, my own institution uh, down in this um, uh, corner here, this right-hand corner, these were demonstrations on campus at the University of Bristol. Uh, Sit-ins that had taken place, took place over at least several weeks from students, uh, engaging students in politics on that campus that are very rare. Um, my institution is uh, uh, what's regarded as part of uh, the Russell Group, which is uh, a self-named, uh, it's a way of self-naming uh, a more elite uh, group of universities um, sitting below uh, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, largely uh, pub public school students, in other words, privately educated, um, largely uh, heading um, off for uh, jobs in the city. Um, many of these students would be moving into the finance and investment sectors. Um, if they're not, then moving into other areas um, like politics and um, uh, medicine and, and so on. So it's been the uh, both on the streets um, and um, across the campuses, um, the kind of um, engagements with politics and engagements around funding of higher education in ways in which people say they haven't seen it for many decades. And what, you, what, you, what I think we've seen um, is a series of platforms, uh, students advancing those, students that you don't normally see engaged in political activity, um, trying to um, advance uh, a claim around saving um, the university and saving our university, that universities are a public good and so on. Um, now I want to return to that because this fairly high level of protest is of concern to the politicians and it's not um, uh, and they are very aware of um, things these kinds of um, 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 popular um, and street based struggles taking place in uh, places like Egypt Tunisia and so on um, in other words um, a, a large group of students who feel disenfranchised um, and some of the senior commentators on higher education have been putting uh, warnings to politicians um, about uh, the levels of volat volatility that might well emerge out of the kind of changes that we're currently looking at uh, which I'll detail um, shortly um, but these have been extraordinary scenes and they're continuing. Um, there are major ballots out now for staff to strike. Uh, there are major ballots out for staff to uh, resist uh, very severe uh, cuts in pensions, uh, cutbacks in staff and so on. So that's what we'll kind of get to. Um, but how might we think about the crisis? I mean, it's one thing then to say that this is a crisis of capitalism, um, but how does that involve the state? And we found it very useful to go back to uh, Klaus Off's work, where Off is actually at that, uh, in, in the um, 70s um, uh, thinking through with his colleagues um, as they actually met and debated these issues, Habermas, um, and O'Connor and others um, on different campuses um, in both continental Europe and in the United States. And what Klaus um, argues is that essentially much of the thinking on the crisis, if we're not kind of thinking of kind of long run crises built into capitalism um, in ways in which uh, Marx had talked about them, um, tendency for the rate of profit to fall and so on. Um, could we also, if we're looking at a crisis of the state here, begin to say that what's actually needed is a political theory of crisis um, as, um, and, and what's actually going on given that capitalism is crisis uh, prone is that we actually needed a study of um, crisis where the state itself, who's the manager of the crisis tendencies, is itself in crisis. Um, and he goes on, a study of crisis then needs to be focused not on the level of events, in other words, the visible signs of that crisis, but on the mechanisms that generate events. 
In other words, what are the kind of fundamental um, events that generate events or mechanisms that generate these events? And it's there that we need to go to actually look at uh, what the fundamental uh, causes of the crisis are. Now, this was uh, hugely profitable, this kind of work for um, Roger Dale, who's sitting in this audience. Um, in using this kind of uh, work to think about the core problems of capitalism, which he argues um, education as uh, largely a state um, activity, um, itself um, takes on those contradictions uh, into its own uh, fabrics and organisation um, and so on, um, so that those core problems um, actually emerge and uh, generate themselves as frictions in the state apparatus. So if we're looking at the, um, the events or the mechanisms that generate these events, um, what are they? Um, and then how would we actually see them? So for Off, what he argues is that we would see a crisis when what he argues is the, there's a violation of the grammar of social processes. Okay? and the counteracting tendencies in place. In other words, if there's a tendency toward crisis, and what the state must do is put into place counteracting tendencies, then essentially there's a crisis when that social grammar um, that includes the counteracting tendencies simply begins to dissolve and begins to break down. And he looks, begins to look at what resources the state actually has um, in order to generate a set of counteracting tendencies that holds the um, crisis kind of at bay, um, but the potential for crisis always there as a set of tendencies. Now, it's the state, essentially, that um, both constitutionally and organisationally, um, and in its both structure and form, um, it's designed, uh, it, it's actually designed to reconcile and harmonise um, in some way the, these crisis tendencies. So the state's projects around societal cohesion, the state as it has to support accumulation, the state as it has to uh, legitimate, um, and here we'd see, and, and some of our colleagues in the room are interested in those forms of legitimation, meritocracy and so on. So the kind of... Um, legitimation strategies that the state then uses as a set of, of, of countervailing tendencies or counter tendencies to the tendencies of capitalism as a crisis prone system. And the state then is both structurally um, and strategically um, selective in the way in which it's organised to, to try and deal with these crisis tendencies. And so it's kind of interesting then I think to kind of later on then look forward at the neoliberal state and whether the neoliberal state has the kind of resources um, at hand that enables us to, or it, it enables the state to actually um, counter the tendencies of the crisis of capitalism. <coughs> now, those uh, resources that the state uses to manage the crisis, and in Klaus Off's terms, it was a set of fiscal resources, uh, a set of uh, legitimatory resources, and thirdly, um, a set of resources that uh, were to encourage uh, mass loyalty. Um, when they fail to absorb the crisis, then what we have is a crisis of crisis management. And what he argues is that over time, there's an exhaustion of the possibilities of those resources to actually absorb the crisis. Um, listening to or uh, watching, actually, on uh, television uh, yesterday and uh, um, the, um, the, the, the discussions with the reporters on, um, um, in Libya um, and questions, you know, have you lost to Gaddafi? Have you lost your citizens' loyalty? Um, and him standing there, and many of you, I'm sure, have actually seen that reportage because it was played um, over a number of occasions yesterday, kind of insisting <coughs> that actually he still maintained the mass loyalty of his people. Um, but you can actually see across those, uh, across the Arab region, um, that essentially 
that mass loyalty had actually been withdrawn. Okay? Now, some of that loyalty was potentially secured uh, through forms of uh, security and policing and uh, um, imprisonment and those kinds of, of things. But mass loyalty is fundamental to the uh, practice of rule. So what Roger argued in 1982 is that when these contradictions um, essentially begin to uh, really rub up against each other in such a way that we, we have um, a fundamental set of contradictions and, and then a very deep uh, crisis, um, that in essence the system itself begins to uh, collapse and it would need some uh, very serious kinds of interventions and new discourses, uh, new political projects in order to uh, develop some other alternate set of uh, countervailing policies. So essentially the story, um, if we look back, goes rather like this. And it's, it's, if we look at it, um, it's chillingly rather like the present. Rising commodity prices. Currently, food prices uh, are rising very uh, rapidly and dramatically. In the case of the UK, um, the cost of living has risen um, about 37%, and this is according to um, the uh, major newspapers, uh, the, finance, the Financial Times and so on. So in the case of the UK, it's not just uh, fuel prices, but the cost of food for example, um, has risen quite dramatically. And this was certainly the case in Tunisia and Egypt. So rising commodity prices characterised the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, declining profitability. And again, we can see that at the current time in the, uh, in, in the United Kingdom, where firms um, are increasingly moving offshore because of um, the declining uh, profitability uh, pr profit margins they can make, in part because in areas like um, pharmaceuticals, they're quite heavily regulated or increasingly regulated in relation to drug trials um, and so on. But also you have other players in the market, um, which also means that there's that tendency for the profit, uh, rate, rates of profit to decline. Accelerating uh, labour costs um, and... Um, although it's very difficult to see that labour costs have been accelerating, um, and we might actually say that there's been an acceleration of the, uh, the costs of some of the high-end uh, labour in particular. Um, and in, in the early 1970s, or late 60s, early 1970s, a movement of industries to the less developed economies. Um, and again, the kind of contemporary comparison here would be specifically, particularly to China, although the pharmaceuticals industries are moving into places like uh, Vietnam and so on where there are uh, way fewer regulations on their kinds of activity. But pharmaceuticals is a very big uh, industry for the United Kingdom. There was then a search amongst the uh, developed Western economies uh, for a new basis for capital accumulation, um, and fundamentally they turned to looking at the services sector. Now, Increasingly, um, as time went on, that got represented as these economies uh, attempting to create knowledge-based economies, but the fundamental need to create a new value base in order to support accumulation and what goes with a productive uh, accumulation sector is redistribution through taxation into the public sectors um, would be and is a, a new value base. And I want to kind of look at what the uh, view is for universities as to what that new basis um, ought to be. The production of goods, of course, uh, was largely uh, moved out into the Asian economies, and then we see the Asian economies take off, Japan um, and uh, all, Singapore, all those economies, Malaysia and so on. So services uh, it gets marked out, gets carved out, uh, essentially over uh, the next several decades as the areas where uh, those um, developed economies would be specialising. And so therefore it's not accidental, I would argue, that uh, they drive forward um, a, a, a real interest in carving out and, and regulating services and the entry into national territories around the provision of services through uh, the advance of the General Agreement on Trade and Services, um, the creation of the World Trade Organization as a mechanism to advance that. Um, but these were, these were forums that were created to really advance the interests of those kinds of economies. Um, they were clearly 
not necessarily, they are not necessarily and have not necessarily been successful. Uh, many of the developing countries have blocked those negotiations. Um, they've banded together um, in part because they've argued that uh, um, what's at risk for them is um, the development of their own economies and their ability to, um, through uh, more equal kinds of negotiations uh, advance their own interests. Um, so that's an ongoing project, uh, but nevertheless it, it emerges in the late 1970s, early 1980s in order to take forward uh, a new value base. Keynesianism is discredited, and I think there's a really interesting lesson for us here. Um, through the 1970s, what most of the governments were doing was putting more money into um, state planning, Keynesian reactions um, to policy, um, pumping more and more money into uh, unemployment, but that was rising very radically uh, in, in ways that they couldn't manage. And you can actually begin to see that essentially there's a fiscal crisis for the state in the ways in which the clouds off then begins to talk about a fiscal crisis of the state. A crisis of rationality, as Habermas then also described it, um, in the sense that um, the, uh, the state itself was seen to be an administrative apparatus that couldn't manage the crisis. Um, a, a turning away from uh, the, the state as a, a planner and, a, and, and having the capacity to plan and secure uh, the interests of its population. What that did by the early 1980s is open up that space for neoliberalism as a political project to begin to be advanced. Um, now, it wasn't a new project. It was a project uh, in various forms and guises that had been around since the 1930s. Um, various iterations of neoliberalism um, and the, uh, th that uh, were there uh, debating, uh, discussing, and so on. Um, a number of attempts, particularly in the post-war period, to advance neoliberalism, but the spectre of socialism uh, essentially uh, worried many of the uh, governments in the West, and they looked to, trying to, to try and actually work out some kind of political solution that absorbed the, uh, the, the, the population uh, in, in various ways, in forms of redistribution and so on. However, Keynesianism essentially by the late uh, 1970s, early 1980s, simply uh, those, those, uh, those second round of efforts uh, through that period of time um, were found uh, fundamentally not to be working. And countries like uh, Australia where I was, um, it is essentially was a very deep crisis to the point that um, uh, it, it became almost impossible for the government to actually begin to pay some of its wage bills and, and so on. Neoliberalism, um, of course, uh, embeds itself uh, across a, a range of different countries um, and in a range of different uh, forms or translation projects. New, new public management would be one that we recognise in the public sector, um, but it's not the only one. Forms of uh, liberalisation, privatisation and so on were uh, the forms that we could see um, beginning to characterise these kinds of social formations. They advance in the UK, uh, in, in the United States uh, and in the, the, the kind of satellite uh, kind of regions of the world, Australia and New Zealand. Um, New Zealand where uh, Roger and Dale and uh, myself both uh, lived and worked. Um, could see firsthand the way in which a textbook case of neoliberalism was being advanced. And they could advance it in New Zealand because it didn't have the political structures that would actually limit uh, the rapid um, uh, insertion of neoliberalism into that society. Those things subsequently have been put into place, uh, but by that time uh, very serious damage had been done in the sense that uh, uh, unions um, bar one were basically completely annihilated. I think the teachers union was probably the only, um, and, and the academic labour union were the only standing unions at the time, but very significant uh, privatisation and liberalisation, which in terms of liberalisation essentially meant they were open to uh, the circuits of finance capital as they moved through those economies. Um, 
if you watched the newspapers at that time, essentially there would be a heartbeat on the cover of the newspaper and the health of the economy in terms of what was happening to the flows of finance through those economies um, as financial speculation and so on and new financial pro uh, products actually emerged um, really meant that those economies were um, at the behest of finance capital. If we look at the higher education sector, um, what we see is the translation of neoliberalism um, in various uh, guises uh, into uh, the higher education sector, um, transforming that sector. Competitivism became a dominant logic, um, so higher education sectors themselves had to be more, more competitive. What that meant is that they had to be more efficient and more effective. Um, and in many ways you know this story, so I'm not going to labour it. Um, However, it's to say that just two things. Um, knowledge economy arguments at this point get advanced to essentially legitimise the creation of a, a services sector that would potentially service the rest of the world. Um, and the form that then takes in higher education, of course, is very significant transnationalisation of higher education provision. Um, in, in other words, international students uh, coming to the UK, paying for fees and so on. Um, a very high level of focus on um, the idea of human capital and skilling up the labour force in order to meet the demands of a competitive uh, knowledge-based economy. Um, but what was also very seductive for the UK was what was called the magnet economy thesis. So the argument is essentially this, that if the bodywork moves offshore and goes to the Asian region and Asia becomes the factory of the world, what the developed West would take for itself was the headwork. And that the West uh, and economies like the UK, through <coughs> their education systems and their investments in human capital, would take for itself the high value added end of the value chain. Okay? And so higher education was to be producing engineers, it was to be producing um, a whole range of um, skilled professionals um, able to work in the high value added end of the economy. Now Phil Brown and Hugh Lauder have argued that that, that thesis, the magnet economy thesis, that is all the brains around the world would want to come and concentrate themselves in the US, in the UK, and in these high value added uh, economies um, was fundamentally flawed um, in the sense that uh, they, they assumed that places like China would continue to want to be the factories of the world. And as China itself has um, advanced its own project of being um, a leader in the world, to overcome what it would argue is um, a, the century of humiliation to, as China itself and to some extent India, but um, those other Asian economies also setting themselves out as being service-based economies, but also um, wanting to learn from the West, uh, wanting to also pull back their skilled labour into China. Um, that this thesis, this, not, this magnet economy thesis left the UK economy um, in, a, in, a, in a state of knowledge that was fundamentally flawed. And I, can, I would agree with Phil Brown and Hugh Lauder on this. Um, I was um, involved in quite a high level um, for, foresight project. So th these are projects um, that Klaus Off actually argues um, are projects that the state often engages in in order to scan the horizon, to know what's out there and know, know how best to steer the economy and so on. And what was astonishing for me um, about this foresight um, uh, series of exercises, uh, it was chaired by the chief economist. It had uh, uh, around 10 people on the panel advising um, and the outcomes of these scenarios that were being built about the state of the world would then be uh, the scenarios that would actually be informing Treasury and uh, other parts of government. And what I know uh, was that these scenarios then were used to do the planning within the state, the UK government, um, across all the different uh, departments. So if you have built into your um, 
scenario planning, your foresight projects, the way you read the future, this sense that uh, China um, will continue to, to see itself as a place in the world, as the factory of the world, and of course in many ways it, it also is, but it has other ambitions, then essentially you can see how to some extent um, you, you don't see um, the dangers coming and these dangers I'll begin to talk to you about in terms of um, what Lauder and, and, and Brown call kind of a, an emerging global auction for skills. Um, and, um, and, and in the UK essentially um, they are some of the losers in this auction or at least UK graduates are the losers in this auction and not the winners. So. What did the first stage or phase of neoliberalism look like in the United Kingdom? Um, for those of you um, who read the higher education literature, um, this will be a very familiar kind of scenario. But it's quite important for us to kind of put that on the table because it's that basis uh, that's now going to be intensified, uh, the value base, the social relations uh, that emerge for universities out of these forms of reform. So from the mid-1980s under the Jarrett report, we see uh, very considerable corporatisation taking place. Uh, if we were to look into uh, places like Australia, um, what we would see is fairly similar kinds of patterns emerge, merging as well. Uh, Simon Marginson, who's a major commentator on higher education um, in the Australian context, um, talks about uh, the emergence of the enterprise university. And we would be able to recognise the English university in this kind of context. An attempt to put on the table um, a private university, it's not for profit, but students pay very high fees at this university. Um, it's something like £18,000 a year, um, but this university works quite intensively with small classes um, and students study at this university over a two year period which is quite attractive for international students because they're not there for three years. Um, now, I don't know what that looks like on the Bologna uh, formula, but essentially um, it's the first uh, endeavour in the UK at um, a fully private university uh, because, of course, Oxford and Cambridge are not um, private universities like some of their US counterparts. They're public universities. Students get public funding to go to those universities in terms of um, subsidised uh, tuition fees and so on. 1992, um, so there's pressure to um, begin to uh, invest in human capital um, and in 1992 with the removal of the divide between the polytechnics and the universities, um, what we see is a, a doubling of university students essentially by taking that divide away. Um, the sector doubles overnight. By the late 1990s, um, the, uh, a, a, a series of reports begin to emerge, but the one that is notable here is the Deering Report, who begins then to um, look at, um, in, in a much more fuller way, the implementation of um, some of the elements of new public management and begin to advance some of the elements of what he called, at that particular point in time, um, a learning society. The Labor government under Blair was elected in 1997. And what you see is a very uh, sharp move in the direction of an intensification of an economistic discourse. So if we look back at Deering, Deering is still um, endeared um, or committed to this notion of a learning society. And what's interesting too, if we look at that period of time, there were a number of circulating discourses, a learning society, um, a knowledge society, a learning economy, a network society and so on. But by um, the late 1990s, um, not only in the OECD, but we also see it in the context of the UK, there's a settling on the idea of the knowledge-based economy. Okay? So the idea of the societal paradigm kind of being removed from that. Our competitive future kind of laid down the tracks um, that was then to really guide the Labor government um, forward. 
So we see an, ex uh, an expansion of access, and uh, Deering himself had been very committed to access, um, and figures being set at around 50%. But this is access in order to genera generate human capital for the labour market and for this so-called knowledge-based economy. Um, a number of reports I don't have in here, but 2003, a very significant report by the Lambert Review um, arguing that universities need to um, add a third mission in to move away from just a, a, a focus on two missions, which is teaching and research, and to add in a third mission that included an engagement with the business sector. And here, what he had in mind was um, a way in which universities could uh, use the knowledges that were being generated in the university and use those knowledges in order to uh, start small to medium industries uh, or enterprises in their cities and in their regions in order to generate competitive regions. What Lambert is reflecting on is fundamentally, and, and what's guiding uh, the kinds of policies at this point, is what he can see happening to the fundamental economic base. Okay. So many of the uh, very big uh, transnational firms or, or, or British-based transnational firms had been bought up by the US. And those that re remained, many of them were actually relocating um, very key parts of their uh, research infrastructures um, and their uh, uh, research and development infrastructures and so on, or the whole of their firm into uh, different parts of the world, but particularly the Asian region. Um, and there's a very interesting table that he uh, presents um, as part of the evidence for why universities need to now be the engines of their cities and of their regions um, in order to uh, generate um, um, a new kind of relationship between um, the university and the local and regional economy. So now the kind of investments essentially in small to medium enterprises and a clustering of those small to medium enterprises potentially uh, around the university. There was a dramatic expansion too in full fee paying students, so this prioritising of international students um, and for the moment uh, it sits at about 8% uh, of income for the sector. Um, but the, the UK has um, a declining overall share of international students. Australia has raced up to be a major supplier, not the biggest, but it's, it's an increasing supplier of education services. Uh, countries like Singapore, um, for instance, um, are attempting to expand their offer to international students. China, for the moment, uh, is now the fifth largest um, um, supplier of education services globally. Now, these are short study programs largely for US students, but its ambition is to be a provider of services, edu education services internationally. So this idea that the developed economies would be the magnet economies, they would be the, the economies that would attract the brightest and the best of students and retain those students in those economies, um, as has been the US model for its own research and development, is very significantly, it was part of the plan, but increasingly it's under pressure um, and for the reasons that I've just described. There was also through this period um, the um, um, increased uh, expansion of the um, private for profit sector. Um, so we see uh, s uh, some Australian firms, some US firms, uh, firms like Kaplan, for example. Um, I think I've Yes, this would be the kind of subsidiaries that um, Kaplan, which is a very large uh, for-profit firm, has in uh, the UK at the last year. Uh, so this was kind of dated in 19 uh, or, or 2010. Um, what you can see is that it, it is uh, specialising in areas that are very uh, productive for it, that is language and so on. But uh, if we were to look at, let's say, Laureate, it provides um, specific courses as part of a master's program at a very distinguished university, the University of Sussex. So what we see is the global inserted into 
the provision of publicly funded uh, universities. Okay. Um, and so this is just one outfit uh, that has um, operations um, all over the world, um, but its operations um, in the, the case of the, the, the UK. Um, in many cases, um, some of these kinds of firms are on campus. Um, they uh, go into uh, joint ventures with uh, universities and then they share the profits um, of these. And some of the concern at the moment is that we may, might well see an expansion of these kinds of um, operations. In 2007, um, BPP, which, is, which specialises in providing master's level um, law and uh, business uh, qualifications, um, was awarded degree awarding capability. And it did that in a very interesting way. Um, it moved away from making those claims in the uh, World Trade Organization under the GATS agreements and went straight back down into the National Territory and to the Privy Council, put its case, and that case was awarded. So essentially, what we know is that there's a whole series of cases now in the Privy Council that uh, would if the uh, profits are there, um, open the, uh, the doors to a range of other for-profit providers. Let me just come back here. So they begin to operate with a new mandate, essentially, um, for, from, um, from government. Um, and that has um, enabled uh, BPP to be then taken over by Apollo Global, which Apollo Global is half-owned by one of the big private equity firms uh, that um, operates as one of these um, asset strippers and so on. So there's very interesting kind of tie-ups now between who are education providers and those who operate in the global uh, capitalist system, essentially, and what that then may, might ultimately mean for the regulation of higher education. Um, I mentioned um, earlier um, the percentage that comes from international students, and you can see in, in this pie chart here um, non-EU domicile um, HE fees um, sitting at about 8%. And the current view by the government is that uh, it's that area that will um, now, it ought to be expanded to um, overcome the very significant uh, resources that have been taken out of the higher education sector. And I'll reflect on that because uh, in my reading of, the, um, of, of what's going on, on out there, um, that's very unlikely to, to, to be realised. And if that's the case, what we're very likely to see is collapsing universities um, as, um, in, in essence, that market is, is starting to dry up. And we can see it in countries like Australia. There's a drift, essentially, to... Um, the West East, if you like, um, of um, potentially students, uh, particularly uh, US students, making calculated decisions about where strategically it would be best to secure your future. And learning Mandarin, um, having a sense of the China uh, region and or the Asian region is one of those kinds of calculations. Now, what I'm going to argue here is that um, The current crisis for neoliberalism is then a crisis, not a crisis management in a sense, but what's, what's the outcome of the way in which the neoliberal state managed? The neoliberal state managed largely through governance. Okay? And governance essentially means the coordination of um, a range of different um, um, actors, and a range of different activity, but where the state itself was not directly funding or providing or regulating or building, okay? Like the Keynesian welfare state. Okay? So the Keynesian welfare state essentially was very much a hands-on central planner, largely one size fits all. Um, and when it moved back to try and steer through to, to steer through forms of regulation, um, it in some cases was quite hands-off if you look at the finance sector and possibly in part because it, it itself didn't understand the kinds of uh, 
forms that the finance sector would, very innovative forms of financial products and those kinds of things that the finance sector would be able to generate for itself. So, um, uh, and even um, I would say many of us around the room simply don't have the kind of uh, kind of levels of literacy to understand how. Um, the uh, overnight money markets worked, how hedge funds worked, how um, uh, the, uh, the ways in which the commodity markets uh, worked. But what I do know is, for instance, that many universities in the UK um, and many universities in the US would put money out, university money, out on the overnight money market and actually make money. Okay? Now, um, what that's doing is also uh, driving uh, the... Uh, finance capital around the world in search for um, places where it can make, um, in very short periods of time, money, take that and then move to a different place. So it's kind of, it's, it's playing on um, the way in which hedging is actually also working. Um, the person who writes very well on this is um, Saskia Sassen in a fairly readable kind of way, um, where she actually looks at the way in which the finance sector itself uh, becomes and uses new technologies very innov innovatively. So essentially, um, it's the uh, physicists and the mathematicians who are actually writing the algorithms that are actually able to make very fine levels of uh, computer-generated judgments around what's actually happening on the world markets, and then selling very quickly um, either up um, and, and down. So this is the kind of way it was actually working. So we have a finance sector which, uh, in, the, in the words of uh, Giovanni Arigi, um, you typically see um, emerge at, the, at a particular period of a long wave of capitalist expansion. And in looking back to the 1400s and looking forward, he argues that what he can see through these long-run historical analyses is in those twilight, or what he calls the autumn years, finance capital come to the fore. But finance capital is not productive. Um, it's parasitic. Um, and eventually it will actually collapse and we kind of see that there. As uh, bad money uh, emerges, um, no one wants to touch it, no one wants to lend to each other and so on. So that's what's going on and that's what fundamentally drove the boom that uh, we saw um, over the period of the 1980s, uh, 90s and to the late um, 2000s, um, which is essentially, we see the bubble actually burst. At the same time, what neoliberalism has done is deliver, deliver um, a fragmented sense of loyalty, um, a breakdown in a notion of social cohesion, um, and a sense that economic sovereignty in the form of consumerism is the dominant form of sovereignty, so as long as I can be a chooser, in a marketplace. So this was the kind of subjectivity on offer. Um, and while I wouldn't want to universalize that, so that in terms of that was the kind of take up, um, nevertheless, um, it begins to, uh, I would say, uh, at least discursively, dominate uh, both our language and in many cases our practices, even if we were critical of the kind of consumer-based uh, practices and so on. At the same time, the neoliberal state has begun to cede sovereignty across scales. It's ceded some sovereignty to the private sector, which it doesn't easily get back in uh, an ability to regulate. It cedes sovereignty across scales um, upwards, um, both to uh, other regional projects that are underway, to uh, global institutions and so on. Um, and I would actually want to say that even some of its kind of um, managing systems through uh, PISA, um, those knowledge-based systems that reflect back or give back to national states, um, accounts of how its competitiveness is actually going, is the way in which you would see some of its foresight and planning um, being uh, taken up at, at a different kind of scale. So the OECD, in many senses, in the kind of scenario building that we saw do for higher education, takes on the role of the state in terms of its the kinds of administrative activity that the state would have actually done um, and the kind of rationalities that it, that it needed in order to do that. These, these move up a scale and to a large extent it's not able to control 
um, the kind of nuanced data that you would actually really need to understand a national territory. And I think you've got a, a good example of that here in the case of Slovenia because what the OECD is working with is um, largely a template with, it's almost like a McDonald's, you know, you go to Australia and you might add beetroot, but it's the same kind of product. Now, that's not useful <coughs> for a state that's in crisis. In other words, it doesn't know what's going on easily um, in its national territory and then has not got the kinds of policy levers in place that would enable it to, in fact, develop some of those countervailing kinds of tendencies. So in many ways, what we see, I think, is a crisis of regulatory policy in the way in which, speculatively, um, Klaus Off puts up in in his writings in the mid-1990s as he's kind of working with the logic of neoliberalism as what he would argue as a massive form of state intervention. Because when the state also decides not to um, support its population through forms of redistribution and so on, these are decisions that the state is actually making. So it's quite interventionist in terms of the effects on its citizens. So let's look at uh, what's on offer now um, in the UK um, in the face of a state that has largely lost, I think, some of its steering capability. There's an attempt, I would say, from the current government, which was uh, more recently elected. It's a coalition between uh, 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 the so-called Liberal Party and uh, a Liberal Democratic Party. So here we'd have a fairly conservative party in terms of um, more free market oriented, minimal state and so on. Uh, a Liberal Democratic Party which has joined with them. Um, it's a kind of mix. It likes to think about itself as having some of the values of a more socialist or social democratic kind of political party. Um, on the other hand, you see it's also committed to elements of the free market um, and so on. So essentially as the, that party gets elected, what we see is um, it really drives forward very dramatic and very deep changes. Um, the UK Comprehensive Spending Review, um, in fact, if we start to look at the kinds of uh, funding that will actually come out of um, the UK higher education sector, it looks uh, something like this. The Comprehensive Spending Review, uh, which was released uh, late last year, uh, will take something like three billion out of the higher education sector from the publicly funded grant. And that's about 20% of funding. Now, if your dean was sitting here, um, and I don't think he's here. <laughs> he would really be tearing his hair out because 20% is actually a very significant amount when the margins have already been uh, fairly tight. So this is not this is not um, a sector that's actually been awash with 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 money. Um, leading up on up to that period, um, there was something like um, a third of a billion that had already come out of the sector um, up until that point. Okay. Um, the Public sector, so, so what we see is the finance sector largely remaining intact. What we see is London making very strong arguments that, the, uh, that finance capital will leave London and London will no longer be the finance capital of the UK and of the globe. So to a large extent, um, and in part the political parties have been bought off, I think, through quite significant donations to the, the, the ruling political party, is that finance capital, that is the cause of the financial crisis, um, in large part because it has not been regulated um, at all. Um, essentially, this was this notion that it would be uh, let, the market, uh, let, let the market know how the market wants to work and it would regulate itself, um, is simply now going on its same uh, merry way. It's been represented then as a crisis of the public sector. So this is a crisis then of the public sector that requires the public or all of us, it's argued or presented to us, to, um, ex to have to um, weather the storm despite the fact that the public had actually put very significant amounts of money 
on the table to bail out the banks. It's the public that now has to face quite dramatic changes over the next four years. The idea of the big society is the dominant legitimating um, uh, rhetoric. Um, now, whether they can hold this idea of the big society, uh, that society, it argues, that will um, mobilise voluntary labour, mobilise communities to take on all kinds of uh, responsibilities to cover the space where the state has withdrawn and the state has withdrawn funding, um, is yet to be tested. Um, the Prime Minister has been quite assertive in saying that this is a great passion of his, but it's extremely difficult to see how actually uh, it would be able to fundamentally succeed. Um, and my sense is that it won't, and in part because, as we know, the expansion of the uh, not-for-profit uh, and charitable um, arenas and so on, or the NGO sector, um, these were redistributions of state funding. So if the state's withdrawing its funds, these uh, charities, NGOs and so on, simply will not have the funds in order to operate unless they get them from somewhere else. Um, a move now to uh, local level planning um, through what are called local economic partnerships and a removal of the, uh, the what were regional development agencies, which were quite crucial because universities did quite a lot of city, regional, university-oriented work with several universities potentially coming together, organised through regional development agencies. Those who actually have now gone and, in essence, what it will be largely will be single universities in their cities potentially now competing also with each other. Um, and it's not that they didn't do that before, but um, there are some interesting kinds of developments in some very difficult uh, regions that did emerge because of the work of the regional development authority. Now, David Watson, who I'm sure Pavel knows very well, has actually said this um, about these kinds of policies. The engagement between higher education researchers, higher education practitioners and policy makers can often seem like a dialogue of the deaf. Okay? And I'm sure those of you in the policy making arena uh, recognise this uh, very well. There is the problem of sequence when policy choices seem to be made in advance of research-led investigation of the field. There's the problem of premature closure when policy options are apparently chosen without full consideration of the alternatives. And for example, the regional development agencies and their relationships to universities would be one of them. There's the problem of oversimplification when judgments about a policy choice are presented in aggressively certain terms, and that is definitely what we're looking at the current time. There's a, a, a very um, aggressive um, advancing of uh, the need for deep cuts within the public sector um, if we're to actually survive into the future. Um, and they're aggressively pursued um, and um, I mean, and, and I, I suspect that aggression is going to be problematic because they've actually made uh, more recently some spectacularly stupid mistakes, um, which actually raise all kinds of legitimacy issues for the current government. There's the problem of coordination when policies pursued by different arms of the same government, either within a department or more seriously in relation to higher education across several government departments, because higher education isn't run out of one government department, can confuse and, in and inhibit each other. There's the problem, of course, of selective attention, and perhaps most important, there's the problem of corporate memory, when a policy fails to be assessed against the history of the last time it was tried. The UK is particularly bad at the last one of these. In other words, policies um, that um, we, we actually know have failed, um, but still emerge at a later point in time as part of that policy repertoire. So I've talked about, uh, over the period 2012-2015, more than three billion um, in a block grant coming out of the higher education sector, and it's going to come out of teaching. And it will come out of the teaching of arts, social science and humanity students. And that will be made up by the student who will take out a loan and make a contribution through that loan to their, their, um, their teaching in those areas. Um, and student fees will now, these are fees, not living 
grants will rise to anywhere between 6,000 and 9,000. So this is much more in line with what you see with a, a kind of US-based uh, system. And that will begin in 2012. There will be some money for scholarships, not significant. Um, but uh, what's interesting about the student loan scheme, and it's worth kind of looking at this um, in more detail, um, is that you actually will pay it back when you earn over 21,000. Now, essentially, you have to be in the labour market then in the UK. So it's not getting these grants from the student loan agency and once you leave university, which is the current state of affairs, uh, or has been the current, more, more recent state of affairs, you begin paying it back, which is actually the American model. Um, in this case, and it's a little bit more like the Australian model, you begin to pay back that loan once you reach uh, 21000 Now, what the government argued was that this was a much more efficient way of dealing with the student loan system. Um, and what it did is it said, we've got males that go to universities, we've got females that go to universities. Uh, we'll say there's 50, 50% 50 males, females, and we'll say that the uh, average income that's actually earned when students first enter the labour market will be roughly about so, roughly about 18 to 21,000. Now, of course, more females go into undergraduate courses and complete in the UK than males. Okay, there's been a significant decline in the number of males going in relation to females. So the first thing is that um, males and females don't go in, in equal numbers. And why that matters is because the first year out for a female, their salary is likely to be around about 50% less than on average a male. Um, and these are figures that are actually coming out of HEPI, which is the Higher Education uh, Policy Institute that's been looking at these kinds of figures. So if you have more females earning significantly less, what you'll find is that the scheme that's very dependent on uh, being able to then uh, return back to the, to the student loan system and therefore back to government um, the kinds of outlays that are being made through the loan system, there will be a very significant shortfall of money. Okay. So that's the first issue. The second issue is, and this comes to the kind of arguments that uh, Phil Brown and Hugh Lauder have been developing, and that is that we can see now for graduates very significant depression of graduate wages. Ten years ago, um, this is very anecdotal, uh, my daughter, as a young 16-year-old schoolgirl, um, was earning £6.50 an hour. Uh, she completed a master's degree recently, and she's not, she's not unusual. And the highest salary that was on offer for her for three days a week with two degrees was um, £4.50. Very significant depression. Now, that happens in part because uh, there's an oversupply of graduates, and you might say that uh, as things get better, then there will be um, uh, a capacity to absorb graduates. But if you look at the evidence coming through from the United States, um, there have not been, though there's economic uh, growth occurring, there are no more new jobs being created. Now, if you also add in the fact that um, some of the strategy for the UK in accession in, in, was, was to actually enable um, skilled labour potentially to come across from the accession countries and uh, enter into the UK, but at significantly lower wages. What this does is it, it significantly depresses the, um, the, 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 the price of labour. So essentially, and this is where I'll actually begin to conclude, I want to kind of then go back to Klaus Off and look at the kind of um, intensification of the neoliberal project. Okay? Intensified consumerism, uh, intensification of notions of choice, intensification of notions uh, that, that the sector will actually be saved through many more international students coming in. We can see that that's not the case. The UK's share is actually dry, 
drying up. Um, and then begin to say what's actually the likely scenario. What I'm going to argue is that this current period cannot sustain itself. And it's very much like the period of time that we saw in the mid to late 70s, early 1980s, where you see um, Keynesian uh, intervention strategies, uh, the tools that had created the crisis being deployed to try and manage the crisis. Okay. And what you can see, I think, here in this case, um, nuanced in part because of party political issues, is um, essentially some of those elements that Klaus Off talked about potentially um, on the agenda. The graduate premium argument, which actually encouraged students to invest in themselves. Okay. That graduate premium is hugely distorted by doctors, lawyers, dentists, and uh, those who work uh, and those who do business studies. Okay? Um, in the main, most graduates do not return a significant premium at all. Um, and in some cases, um, it's, it's a negative um, rather than the estimated um, 380,000 over the course of the lifetime, which actually is, is significantly distorted by those particular uh, professional groups. So there will be, a, I would argue, and there's increasingly a crisis of legitimation, and the student protests are, are one uh, litmus of that. The political trade-offs on the student loans, um, essentially the student loan system that we have in place, um, the outcome of um, the uh, Liberal government wanting to, uh, to actually take up office, it has to do that in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. Um, it generates uh, a, a, a lo student loan package, but it has major errors, fundamental errors built into it. It is the state that will actually underwrite the costs from the student loan system. So here we have the finance sector very nicely having moved into um, and uh, will take from the financialisation of the higher education sector in the UK. But it's the state that will actually take the brunt of the uh, deficit here. The third element, the commodification of education, um, the student protests, staff protests and so on, um, are seriously raising questions about the mission of the university. Um, and while these are often kind of crude slogans around commodification, public and, and, and so on, the prioritising of the third mission, okay, it's this kind of uh, activity here that universities are supposed to engage in, spin-out firms, start-ups, staff start-ups, um, consultants, contracts and so on. These are very small amounts of money that come to the university, but more particularly what they are being picked up um, by those, uh, those who are protesting um, against university, the way in which universities are heading, are also looking at this kind of talk um, about what the mission of the universities is fundamentally about. The radicalisation of students, and I would actually argue uh, staff potentially, uh, and the withdrawal of their loyalty. Um, universities and students represent very large segments of populations. Um, there have been major demonstrations in places that you don't expect them. And fundamentally, um, and the significant tension, I think, between um, other legitimation strategies for rule. Um, so at the current time, uh, despite the fact that universities are expected to internationalise even further to bring in more international students. The increased levels of insecurity within the, the British population um, and uh, anxieties uh, are around um, um, other ethnic groups taking your job, uh, these kinds of issues, has actually uh, forced a, a cap um, and a pushing down of the numbers of uh, migrants or, or, or levels of immigration into the UK. Now, the students have been caught up in that, okay? um, and the sector itself looks as if it's going to lose something like a billion. So um, what you have then essentially is um, different 
fears of the, the uh, subsystems of the state, the immigration system uh, responding to anxieties in that broader population. On the other hand, the education subsystem uh, dependent on levels of migration um, and the uh, contradictions and the tensions that are actually emerging between these kinds of strategies. And it's that kind of thing that Klaus Off actually argues fundamentally um, around those uh, kinds of resources that the state has at, at, at its disposal. We need, can't actually get synergies between different departments and steer those different departments in a, a kind of line that begins to realise uh, and stabilise uh, the state as a manager and the, uh, the society and the uh, basis of its economic development project. Um, then fundamentally you will see a kind of a meltdown. My estimation is that this can hold for three, four years at best, um, and then essentially I think what we'll see is neoliberalism um, being under question and the need to look for an alternate political project. And it's here that people like David Harvey actually argue that what we should be doing is looking at the current time for what that political, those, that alternate political project could be. Um, I know there's some interest in alternate political projects that are emerging in places like uh, Venezuela and so on, but I can see some of those are problematic. Um, but I want to uh, uh, finish now and um, um, hope that that uh, might have um, offered um, a, a kind of argument that might uh, potentially be useful for thinking about what might happen into the future. Thank you, Pavel.